it comes down to what's your passion? What do you love, right? I mean, when you wake up in the morning, do you think about residential sales and that whole kind of fun game of that? Yep. Right. Selling sunset and million dollar listing and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or do you wake up and say, God, you know, I want to, I'd like to, you know, build and do development and own investments and like do different types of real estate, right? Cause there's different ways to make money in real estate. That's the greatest part about real estate is there's yeah. the residential sales side. There's, you know, you can sell loans, you can do hard money lending, you can go invest and flip properties, you can do Airbnbs, you can do multifamily, commercial real estate. There's so many facets of real estate to make money. So people need to consider that when they're doing real estate. It's not just residential sales. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Okay, folks, welcome back to another episode of Rethink Real Estate. Today, we've got, uh, I'm going to say one of the originals. Now, what I mean by one of the originals, Justin... (laughs) I'm going to say this. You were the second auction that ever took place in North America, La Jolla Mesa Drive. Was that was that it? The, the that was one it. Yeah, that was the it. The one that succeeded but failed, but succeeded and failed. Like, it, I mean, it worked. I just, the, just, yeah. I have to be honest. I take solace in the fact that they ended up accepting incredibly less money than what you and I were able to produce for them. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that, Unfortunate. That was, uh, I mean, I, but I learned some great lessons in that one that, you know, we didn't make those mistakes again right no 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 uh, exactly right so. you helped us bla- blaze the trail mate blaze the trail of auction <laughs> in, in, in into la although it's funny uh-huh. i remember the ones the ones after that was on dolphin place we had Mirlands drive we had another one uh, up Ave- on the avenida hill. avenida cortez avenida cortez which was greg barbacanian who is now one of our business owners like and doing auctions and all that type of stuff you led us into that one yeah, and those were all very successful, uh, and it pissed off the agents in La Jolla, oh, yeah. which was the best part because not do the you best re- part. Do you remember that? Do you remember that oh. they all had like a meeting about about oh, you yeah. and about Harcourt? <laughs> yeah, they were trying to blackball the whole thing, which was beautiful. Um, but look, I know all of them; they're great people. We do business together. I love the La Jolla agents, but you know, the the average agent in La Jolla is like sixty five years old. So the concept of auction. In, as we all know, in North America is distressed, right? Like that's the concept, yeah. distressed properties, not, hey, we're going to auction a property that's a normal sale. We're just happening to come from a different direction to arrive at a fair market value, right? Yeah. So that's all it's now happened, we've. So. Now we've we've do, we've dove straight into this. We've just been, get, like it's you, like you and I haven't uh, haven't parted ways at all from about seven or eight nine years ago or however, however much it was. But I think that the one thing that I wanted to do today, Justin, is give a little bit of a background and and get your story because I find your story fascinating. Having coming up with your dad and 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 real estate developing and flipping and all of that type of stuff, getting into the residential real estate space yourself. But the one thing that I'm fascinated with and I want to get to uh, um, by the time you go through your story is that. You You've made a transition out of out of it. You're actually one of the first real estate agents that I've ever met, a realtors that has said, "Look, I want to get out of this with inside a few years and start getting into the multifamily space." And you did. You, you're not selling full time anymore. You still obviously probably do a bit of real estate on the side here and there, but ultimately, you are where about? Are you in Texas today? <laughs> As we speak, I'm in Texas on one of our properties, and I've technically moved into it short term to improve the operations so uh, we can get stuff, you know, in check. You know what I mean? Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing about that, but talk to me about where your real estate journey started, mate. Yeah. So, you know, born and raised in San Diego, um, you know, son of a developer, my dad, and then learned from my grandmother as well, who was 91 years old. Um, But, you know, setting that aside, people don't have to have that background. I was fortunate enough to have it kind of growing up, learning from my dad, digging you know, ditches on his job sites between construction, land development, multifamily, all of that. Um, that was all great and kicking ass until, are we allowed to say anything ass like that on your show? Oh yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Go <laughs> okay. for it. Uh, you can, 
you can run a few f bombs, a few shits, a few right. all of that type of stuff, mate. This is an Australian. It's, do you know it's Australia Day? We're recording right now. Okay, technically it's Australia Day, so well, there's a few affectionate words that you can use. So Fosters, can we use Fosters for beer? <laughs> <laughs> your Australian, your Australian joke game has always been weak, mate. It's, I've got to be honest. Dad, it's dad jokes. Dad jokes. <laughs> uh, but no, I so I learned from my dad on that side. So everything was great until the financial crisis of 2008. Right. And everybody remembers the collapse and my dad's companies collapsed along with it. Uh, I had to help him consolidate all that. Um, but then that kind of provided some opportunities because I became an asset manager for a company called Atlas REO, which was in San Diego. And they were a third party asset management company for a lot of the major banking institutions at that time. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, B of A, Chase, EMC, the list goes on. And so we were managing REO foreclosure assets all over the country. And I had two, three hundred, you know, single family properties that I was managing at a time and hiring the realtors, right? The REO agents to manage those assets all over the United States. And I did that for about two years. That was 2009, 2010. But then I saw kind of this transition happening where it was going from foreclosure, where the bank owns it, to short sale, where the homeowner controls it, but it's still distressed. And mm. I saw this needle moving and I went to the owners of the company. Um, and I said, Hey guys, are you, you kind of see this happening? Like you need to make a movement. How are you handling it? Cause otherwise REOs are going to go like this and short sales are going to go like this. And lo and behold, within 10, 12 months, uh, that's exactly what happened. And wow. I had my brokers, I had my broker's license at that time. So I said, this is a beautiful transition to go help a lot of folks in, in a tough situation, get out of the financial situation they're in. And I came direct from the banks. So I knew exactly what the banks were thinking, which was great because I could walk into a homeowner, sit down, look at all their loans. They had a first, second, third, fifth, 19th loan on the house, whatever. Yeah. And, yeah. Crazy. And start to figure out, okay, this is how we're going to get through it and get you out of the debt and get you moving on. And we did an enormous amount of short sales from probably 2010 to 2012 in San Diego. And then you saw them needle moving again into traditional real estate, right? Where everybody right. had equity and you're selling with equity. Um, so then I got into the luxury real estate game in La Jolla. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, the goal was always to use my real estate license as a catalyst to go buy and invest in property. And right. that's and, and I have to and I have to I have to obviously just I want to hit that. I want to double click on that point, Justin, because how did you have that foresight? Was it your dad? Was it your your grandmother's exposure to the real estate market? Like how did you have that understanding that that was the end game for you eventually when getting into the real estate business? Right. Um, you know, I would say it, the foresight was really in knowing the long-term passive income game is not in the hamster wheel cycle of transactional real estate. Right. I mean, you can do very well as a residential agent. I know plenty of them. You, you can make lots of money. It's not about that. It's a matter of, is that your true passion? Right. And like you wake up every morning and you're like, Hey, I want to go sell some luxury houses. And I want to And the answer to that, that answer to that question, Justin, is absolutely not after a while. I like everybody's like, oh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else and all this type of stuff. Give it 10 years of people grinding you and the grind that it is that you know that you can't go away on vacation because your phone won't ring and you've got to get back onto the grind. Like they don't want that. The passive element is what they want. And and that right. acknowledgement from your perspective of what you wanted to build, I think, has created your vision. It has. And I just knew you know, the, the residential game was great. Uh, and I loved helping people that aspect of it. But I also, the, the part about the residential sales I didn't enjoy was the emotional aspect, right? It's, it's a 100% emotional process of buying and selling. It's not, Hey, do the numbers make sense? And are we making profit? Right? It's, can I see my children playing in the backyard of this home? Can I, you know, I, I don't want to sell because I've owned the home for 40 years and there's so much history. So that emotional side was hard for me because it's a variable completely outside of my control, but it 100% controls my ability to have a livelihood. And I was like, yeah. uh, I, I, it's a, I mean, how do you do that? How do you live with everybody? You have no control over anything, but yet it 100% controls your income, mm. people's emotions. Right. Mm. Um, and that's, that's residential sales and that's okay. Like there's a part of it. I was, 
pretty successful at it. Um, but it was always an end game. We started buying rental property in 2010 in the midst of the financial yep. crisis. So, and we started with a condo, then it went to a single family home rental, then it went to duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes. And then from there we said, okay, we want to grow. Uh, San Diego is not really a place we're, we're in growth mode. We don't, we don't have so much money. Our dollars are only going to go so far. Let's go outside of San Diego. And yeah. before, that's great, before you make that, tra- before you make yeah. that transition, I want to talk about the one thing that, uh, the one thing that I really respected and I loved about working with you, because you had me very early on in North America. Like I was very raw, just still going through the experience stage. We were still auctioning properties on site, you know, all of those different things. And, you know, we can talk about your experience with auction and your insight, because again, you were one of the original thought leaders of it. But that said is that you always had a project going on at the same time that you were doing real estate. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember the one, I remember the one in Point Loma. I remember like that you always had some stuff going on from the development standpoint. How did you dr- juggle the two and, mm-hmm. and, and how did you learn about all of that stuff? Because it still blows my mind because y- you had a very vast understanding of how to raise capital. You obviously had a vast understanding around how to make your dollar stretch to that extent and all of that type of stuff. Plus you were also doing residential real estate as your full-time job. Yeah, um, there's no sugarcoating it when I tell you it was effing hard because, <laughs> I mean, anybody that knows if you want to be successful in residential sales, it's a grind, right? I mean, you're on it and you have to hustle uh, every day. So call it your nine to five, you know, I'm doing the residential side, right? And, and hustling and really go home, hang out with the family, put the kids to bed. And then I realized, uh, listen, if I want to transition at some point, um, especially in residential sales, because it's not like I have a nine to five and I can go show up and sit in a cubicle and get my paycheck on Friday. Right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, I'm waking up hustling. I'm a hundred percent commissioned, right? Yep. The closed yep. mouth never gets fed. And so you got to go out there and hustle. <laughs> And so I'm hustling on that side, 100% commission. Yet on the other side, I want to transition into something that's also 100% commission because it's all about development and creating opportunities and profits and blah, blah, blah. So you have zero income on both ends of that side unless you're yeah. executing. Well, so, sorry, uh, you, yeah. so, so how, did you have the, how did you have the self-discipline though? Like you clearly had... I don't know, a little bit of money set aside to do the development projects, to be in play with them and obviously raising capital as well. You've got to have your own money in the game as well in order for people to give you capital. So how did you show the discipline? Like any realtor will probably have a little bit of savings aside and all of that type of stuff, but that will dip into it when, like I know, Justin, you were one of our more successful agents in San Diego that you know was doing auction and in that time, and then you built a little bit of a team behind you and things along those lines. In the times that you didn't have that success, how did you not dip into the future fund, so to speak, the fund of the investment? Uh, and, and you do. I mean, you dip into the savings, and it's definitely still yeah. a roller coaster until you get to a point where you are generating enough passive income that takes care of your normal daily expenses in life. And it yeah. took the better part of several years, a good three and a half years of hustle, like a mother effer to finally <laughs> be in a position where I was generating enough from the other side of being multifamily to offset the income that I was making as a residential realtor. And the other thing I had to come to terms with that it was hard in the beginning, but then I finally understood the importance of it. The only way I was going to make the transition is if I realized I didn't need to be the famous realtor. I didn't need to be number one anymore or try and be number one. Because, I mean, I was sitting down with a couple of years ago with several big realtors in San Diego, you know, Seth O'Byrne and the lots offs and all these guys I've had coffee with because they've seen kind of me do this. And first thing Seth O'Byrne was saying is, dude, like, how, how do you make that transition? I said, Seth, this is going to be the hardest thing for you. I said, the first thing you need to do is stop being, trying to be number one. Uh, yeah, you know, stop trying to be that's, the famous that's... realtor. Because I said, the minute you realize I need to pull back and maybe not do a hundred million that year or whatever, but I can just do 25 or 30 million and cover my expenses and then start to make this transition. Because yeah, everybody has 24 hours in a day. Yeah. Right? So 
you got time you need to allocate to sales because you need income, but then you need to then allocate time to growing the other side of it, the side hustle, so that can take mm-hmm. over. And the only way that's happening is you got to be able to pull back from the residential sales enough to just cover your nut, if you want to call it that, not be number yeah. one and not be and be okay with that. And, and yeah. I was because for me, I see the bigger picture. Like for me, this is how I see it. Residential sales is a six-figure business, right? You yep. can make a lot of money. Absolutely. Two, three, four, five hundred thousand and up. Yep. Uh, I want seven and eight figures, and that was never going to happen in residential sales. And it's it's not about the money; it's about what the money does. See, money. People say, "What is money? Money? Money makes you happy?" No, I said, "Money just buys you choices." Sure. That's all it does. It buys you choices. Do I do I give back to that charity or not? Can I buy that home or not? Can I go on that travel with my family or not? Right? Do I have the funds to do it? It's choices. And yep. for me, I want lots of choices. And I want those choices built on passive income, not active income. And real right. estate sales is active income. You're in the hamster wheel every day. Every realtor watching this right now understands this. You're in the hamster wheel every day. Where's the next transaction? Where's the next deal? Where's the next closing? Where's the next escrow, right? And for yep. me, that's fine. I just want the other side of it to ensure that you have both ends and you have the passive so, side. Yeah. Let me let me ask let me ask you this. Like, can you, if you're comfortable, can you walk us through the three, four year transition that you went through coming into the passive element that it was enough to cover your monthly nut to call it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what properties did you buy and what decisions did you make? Like I know that it's always going to be variable and then like again we like we did this recently we we went outside of the state and i was very nervous to go outside of the state to purchase a multifamily property because you don't know that market and everything on those lines can you start us off with deal number one and all the way through to building that passive element that you've got now yeah so in simplicity in the beginning i needed about 15 grand a month okay right in passive income to or income from the multifamily however you want yep. to capture it to that, the yep. residential sales, right? So it wasn't, I mean, because I'd gotten my expenses reasonably in line. They weren't crazy. They weren't high. They weren't crazy low. They were in line, reasonable. And so I knew, okay, if I can create 15 grand a month, then I can start to transition like full time yep. and kind of do the, you know, the, the 90 degree turn or the 180 or whatever. Um, and that started in 2018. I mean, I was, um, uh, I was ready to do it. I was, Honestly, I was watching all these other people in the multifamily space, very successful. And I'm like, you know, those mother effers, I can kick their ass. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I said, the only thing stopping me is I got to go and stop. Yeah. You know, but that, but that, at that point said, okay, I need to stop trying to be number one realtor. And yes, that means my production is going to go down. And yes, that means my numbers are going to go down. And yes, that means all that's going to start to move. I get it. But it's for a much bigger picture. Um, yep. And so I had to come to that. That, that well, I, I remember. I, I remember that. I it might not, but it might not have been the moment. But remember, Kevin and I wanted to open the La Jolla location with you, and you literally, you 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 were like, "Yep, okay, yep, 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 let's do it." And then you turned around to us very politely and very respectfully said, "Look, I just I think that I would be get, setting you guys up for failure because I'm out of here within inside six to, six to twelve months because I've made a decision. That yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to yeah, be and doing this." Yeah, I think that was kind of in twenty. That was end of 2019 as we were buying our first property in 2020 and yep. 2020. I mean, all that, uh, that's when it was happening. Um, yep. Cause that's when we had finally gotten into out of state. So that transition started in 2018 where I went to a syndication conference out in Boston and there was like 5,000 investors, brokers, dealers, people, lenders, money, people, everybody, l- attorneys at this conference. I got to meet a, meet a lot of people and connected with a lot of folks in certain markets that I liked. And one of them being Kansas City, Missouri, which right. at that time I was like, Kansas City? <laughs> and, the, and the broker was like, yeah, man, Kansas City. Like, you need to come out and see this thing. Trust me, just come out. And I did. And I made the mistake of going in January. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I think that's when the Patriots were playing – the uh, Chiefs in like an AFC title game, and it was like negative one degrees. It was so cold. Oh god! Oh, <laughs> but I went out and we got to tour Kansas City, and it blew my mind. Like I was, 
like, oh my gosh, I see what's happening here. Like this is path of progress, redevelopment, growth, jobs, population, like everything's moving in here. And it was kind of a, a, a secret at that time. Okay. But now it's a top 10 market in the United States today, like as we speak. So we went in there and we bought our first out-of-state deal, which was a 27-unit deal right in the heart urban area of downtown Kansas City along the urban corridor. And then we saw another one at 30 units, then a 31 unit. And so we got our feet wet because we'd already done, keep in mind, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, five and 10 unit properties locally in San Diego. So we had gotten yep, yep. some our stuff under our belt. So, so, just, so if, you don't mind, if, you, if you don't mind me asking, at this point, going to Kansas City, how much passive income did you have at that point? I was able to cover my nut. At that you're, point. Covering, pretty, you're covering pretty, pretty close. Okay. Pretty close. Okay. Yeah, because there's different fees that come from multifamily. It's not just your passive coming from the cash flow. You're, you know, you have acquisition fees that can come from putting a deal together. It's no different than a commission check on a house. There's yeah, asset yeah. management fees. There's property management if you're doing that aspect of it. Construction management if you're doing the renovation side of it. So there's different levels of fees that can come through the management side. That if you're How generating. Many doors- those- because because it's yourself and your business partner. How many doors did you guys have um, uh, to get to that monthly nut number, so to speak, before you yeah, got so, your out of Yeah, so we only had about 50 units at that point, okay? Okay. But you have to keep in mind, I got some acquisition fees and stuff that kind of filled my bucket, right? And okay. gave me some runway. And with that, then I was like, okay, well, now we can go find some more deals. And then that starts filling the bucket more and more. And then it really starts to off plant, you know, the residential sales stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because right. I mean, when right. you're doing, when you're getting acquisition fees on a twelve or thirty million dollar apartment deal, it can be pretty hefty. You know. So acquisition uh, fees, acquisition fees basically mean you source the deal, you figure it all out, you put it all together. Do you, you 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 don't put the construction plan together or anything along those lines? No, you're doing the whole nine yards. I mean, you'll put right. it all together and then raise the capital, all of it. I mean, it's an enormous undertaking to be a sponsor yeah. on multifamily. And yep. not, not as much in the beginning when you're doing smaller stuff, but as you graduate into the, the larger properties, I mean, there is an enormous amount of logistics and operations. Oh, I could, and, yeah. I could imagine. I remember you sent me a proposal for something that you had once and I'm like, oh my dear God, I'd like, <laughs> I, don't, I get tired even reading it, you know? Yeah. But I guess that the, the, the question that I've got, let's say that somebody's in your position that wants to get to this, but what it was in your, or is in the position that you were, how did you learn about how to get, do this whole acquisition thing? Or how did you learn about the space? What did you do to learn about? Um, so obviously I had a little bit of background with my dad. But that didn't really help out with the syndication side. So syndication, okay. what I mean by that is you're going out and you're with other investors, other people's money, OPM, with your money and their money, you are syndicating together to go buy yep. a real estate asset. Okay. Yes. So that's what syndication is. So understanding that process, the legality process of it, the capital raising side of it, the management side of it. All of that between YouTube and other people that were in it. That's how I learned. That's what I. That's what I wanted you to tell me. I honestly <laughs> wanted you to tell me, like, because well, no. again, like, 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 let's be let's be honest. I learn about U.S. real estate on YouTube. Like, 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 I like, 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 and from the likes of people like you, mate. With all due respect, like, you're the one. You, you're. I'm the one cutting my teeth. You're the one letting me cut my teeth on your real estate listings. I love it. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I guess that you know that the the. The reality, the reality of this is that the self-taught progression is what I really wanted to get out of this is that everything that you did when, when we were working together was always to a perspective of so curious around how it would work. You would ask the right questions and then you would perfect it all the way through that to the point that you became an auction ambassador for us in San Diego. We used to like, you know, no, no, if they don't like it, just sick Justin, Justin on them. He'll, he'll get it right. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you for that. No, I, well, I think once I, um, once I fully understood it uh, conceptually and then saw it work like an action, yep. then it's like almost an epiphany light bulb goes off. Cause then you're like, Oh my gosh, like you've got to, you're cr- I, I would sell my house in an auction right. because why? I mean, cause I understand I'm still protected, right? I have a reserve, nothing changes. Like nothing changes. All you're doing is basically reversing the process and versus coming from a top down perspective, right? Listing price, negotiate down. You're coming from a bidding to start figure and negotiating up. 
Trust me, so he's when still I got saw- the skill. He doesn't. He doesn't lose the skill set. It's like riding a bike. See, look at him go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. And, and once I realized that you get a price similar or in sometimes greater than you would get traditionally, right? And I could prove that to my clients, and they saw it because yep. in their pocketbook, it's a no brainer. You're like, uh, where do I sign? And I'm protected. I can do this. I can do that. He says, yeah, you're not changing anything. You're just changing the direction at which we arrive at the price you're happy with. That's it. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. So, so talk to me more about the syndication element, Justin. I guess that you've learned how to syndicate money at this point, and that's what you took to Kansas City. Is that right? Yeah, correct. And so with the Kansas City deal, that was our first one. We bought a 27-unit. Uh, I think that time it was about $2 bucks. Right for 27 units in Kansas City. We bought another one that was 30 units for a million six. That was in worse condition, but we picked that up. And with those deals, I mean, we were only raising 600,000 on one, uh, I think 700,000 on another one. But to me, that was decent money. Um, yeah, yeah. But in perspective now, it's very little, right? Yep. Because now we're at a point where we're raising seven, 12, 15 million. Right. So it's just a different ball game now. Um, granted, things have changed re- you know, in the last 12 months as we've gone through the capital market, just implosion of 2022. Thank can you, you talk, talk to talk, <laughs> Can you talk to me about that implosion? How is it? How has that affected what you're doing in the multifamily space and give some context to that? Yeah, listen, it hasn't affected anybody who's holding on or was in a position with an, uh, a commercial asset that was on fixed rate debt. OK. Uh, it has affected anything that was on variable rate financing, right? Um, yeah. Any deals that were in construction loans or renovation loans that aren't fixed, right? Um, where, I mean, you take something that we were at a quarter percent. I mean, just to put it in perspective, we were at a quarter percent in March, April of 2022. Yep. And the Federal Reserve went from a quarter percent, right, Fed funds rate, so now we're at four and a half percent. Yep. In they did it in nine months. And if you look at the historicals, like there's a great chart that shows all the last times the Fed has raised interest rates, and you watch like the historical trends. They normally will raise interest rates over an 18 to 24 month window. Yeah. And they'll do it in quarter point and half point pops to allow the market time to really absorb it, right? And not go shock and off actor. Yeah. This time was shock and off actor. And it's scared the living you know what and changed any commercial real estate uh cap rates have changed financing has changed um you know you know we were in a position where we bought a deal the one i'm actually sitting at right now where we bought it in december of 2021 and we knew interest rates would rise and we ran sensitivity analysis blah 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 on it saying okay if they rise here here we can absorb that we can look at that um and so we were fine with taking uh, a bridge debt product. So just to give you background, most value add apartment deals, where meaning mm-hmm. you buy the apartment complex, you're going to have a renovation process to it to improve it, right? Exterior, yep. interior, just like flipping a house, you're flipping an apartment complex. Same yep, concept, understood. right? More units. So those deals are typically financed historically over the last three or five years with short term two and three year bridge debt product. That's variable financing. It's not yes. fixed because the property is not stabilized, right? You're yep. buying something that's not stabilized. You're renovating it. And now you're going to flip into now a stabilized type loan, just like a mortgage on a house. But yep. obviously what happened in 2022 is our interest <laughs> rates went from where they were at and they doubled, right? And in some yes. cases, quite you know, it's crazy. So yes. it's put a lot of pressure. And we're dealing, thankfully, we only have one property that's dealing with that at the moment. Everything else we have is under fixed rate financing and stabilized. But it's certainly, you know, I, I'm hearing rumbles around the whole industry. And I can tell you right now that uh, there's going to be enormous opportunity between now and the middle of this year, 2020. When you say opportunity, what do you, what do you mean by opportunity? Well, like I was saying before we even got on the podcast, you were saying, hey, is there going to be an opportunity this year? Because I said, well, I said, if, if you listen to Grant Cardone, he'll tell you, you know, you always buy when there's blood in the street, even if it's your blood. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, we're dealing with some blood on our own and we're trying to work through it. And I believe we will. 
but there's going to be blood where other people cannot get out of their stuff and yeah. can't pay their debt service and have to fast track sale, like fire sale their properties, their multifamily apartment buildings, or they're going back to the bank. Yeah. Right. How are you? How are you? How how are you finding these deals, Justin? Because the one thing that I was I was curious about is that there's so much institutional money that's come into the category that you're in at the moment. Is that like there is just so much institutional money that's buying up a great deal of property, certainly from a multifamily space. Is it you just getting really gritty to try and find these deals, like to to just like trying to work them out? And like, how are you finding the deals that you're you're getting at the moment from a multifamily perspective? Yeah. So a couple ways. Number one, every market that we were interested in, I flew into that market over the past three years and I have got boots on the ground and I've spent time getting to know the local commercial brokers. Mm-hmm. I have, I know who the construction companies are. I know the property management companies in those markets. I know the good areas, the bad areas, where you want to be. I know where the development is going, the path of progress. I know, you know, we we do something that's unique with our company is we always focus in regions of BRAC realignment. Okay. And this is kind of a, this is our unique selling feature, if you want to okay. say. So, okay. Yeah, I won't tell anyone. Go. Yeah. So my business, well, it doesn't really matter because I can't copy it. That's the beauty about it. So Christopher Poli, my business partner in the Brennan Poli group, you know, he's a tech guy and yep. he owns uh, a couple tech companies. One of them is Capture 2 Proposal, and another one is Tactical Edge. And they design software for the United States military. Okay. Okay. So BRAC realignment stands for Base Relocations and Closures. Okay. So he gets insight well in advance of where the United States military is positioning assets and bases around the country, where they're expanding them, where they're contracting them, expanding and contracting, right? Wow. And moving assets. Okay. So with that in mind, you have the government and then all the private companies that support the government, right? Contracting companies, third party people, private institutions, all those companies that support the military. And then all those people. So what does that mean? That means jobs and it means population growth. So San Antonio, to put it in perspective, is one of the reasons we came here is because it has four major military bases. It's got the head of the NSA's central command of the United States outside of Washington, outside of the East Coast. You have USAA's headquarters here. You have Hulu and a handful of other Fortune 500 companies. And San Antonio is the seventh largest country in the United States that people are like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Right? They don't even realize that until you go through the data and you show them. And so and it's still rel- it's still relatively affordable. We did an auction in San Antonio at the end of last year, not end of last year, middle of last year, and like I'm talking beautiful property for three hundred eighty thousand dollars. Like it's still re- yeah. and like that's oh, yeah. I mean, a million, beautiful. like a million dollars in Texas goes a long way. Right. But what about what? But but obviously Austin's overinflated and just uh, you know has has taken a hit based on the tech perspective injection. Yeah. Like like what what? Why has San Antonio not seen the same thing? Uh, you have a, a real well. I mean, you have a really diversified economy. I mean, here you have a mm. lot of major employers. You have a medical one. It's one of the largest medical industries uh, in the country in San Antonio. Uh, you know, you have some of the Fortune 500, Hulu and USAA, and there's a handful of other ones that are here. Uh, the military is a massive employer here in San Antonio, yeah. both from a government contracting perspective, but also private companies that support it. Sure. Um, so that's pretty massive. And then we always positioned ourselves, like when I came into San Antonio, like I said, I go into the markets and we typically go into every market six to eight months in advance of sure, ever sure. looking to hire an asset. And I'll get on the ground and I'll drive the areas with the brokers. Like I said, I'll know good areas, bad areas, where to be, where not to be, where's development going all of that kind of logistical data stuff that you need to have. And then I'll set up all the infrastructure. So okay. property management companies, construction crews, all the people I need to know, like I have that preset ready to go before we're ever seeing deals come across our desk and now writing offers because, well, okay, yeah, because you need to have that in place. Otherwise you're like kind of trying to catch your tail uh, sure. and then you don't fully understand the market. Right. That's it. Uh, that that takes that takes incredible discipline and insight. So the question the question is, 
Justin, that's prospecting on a different perspective, obviously, like door knocking, cold calling, all of that traditional real estate element stuff. You're obviously preferring to do what you're doing from a from a scouting perspective than of than prospecting and everything along those lines because of the end result of that passive level of income. Because the 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 question I was going to ask you before, when you were talking about the problems with your debt refinancing and things like that in the industry, that's a problem. But would you rather deal with the emotion of a seller, or would you rather deal with this problem? I'd rather deal with this problem in, in, you know, you'd ask the same question to somebody else. They may say the other, right? I think it comes down to what's your passion? What do you love? Right. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, do you think about residential sales and that whole kind of fun game of that? Yep. Right. Selling sunset and million dollar listing and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or do you wake up and say, God, you know, I want to, I'd like to, you know, build and do development and own investments and, like do different types of real estate, right? Because there's different ways to make money in real estate. That's the greatest part about real estate is there's the residential sales side. There's, you know, you can sell loans, you can do hard money lending, you can go invest and flip properties, you can do Airbnbs, you can do multifamily commercial real estate. There's so many facets of real estate to make money. So people need to consider that when they're doing real estate. It's not just residential sales. Yeah. And I think that why, why do you think you kind of answered this before, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is that why do you think that realist, realtors get trapped into the residential hamster wheel? Um, it's, it's easily addicting, right? I mean, the commission check and you know, the, the rush of that is fun and the rush of the deal is cool. Um, I think it's really because it's a 100% commissioned industry. Uh, once it sucks you in, it's really hard. Um, especially the amount of money that has to be spent uh, from the marketing perspective to keep yourself at number one or get to the top. And it's so competitive, especially in Southern California. Um, and everybody's fighting tooth and nail for the little supply that's out there. So it's, it's really difficult to get the consistency, right? So you see this effect a lot with residential mm-hmm. sales, right? Oh, I had a great couple months. Great couple months. Right. And so you see that definitely peak and trough a lot. And I think it, because of that inconsistency, it's hard to plan. Yep. It's hard to get enough, um, you know, nest egg runway to give yourself uh, time to put something else together that will overtake that. So you get stuck and, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll be the last part about it. They're not willing to work hard enough. Because they need to understand that if you're going to make this transition, you are going to have your nine to five, Mm. right? But then you're going to have your eight to midnight. Yep. So nine to five, you come home, you hang out with family, you got your kids, you do all that daddy, mommy stuff. Awesome. Kids go to bed. Your ass is hustling. Get on the computer, doing what you need to do, finding deals, doing research, learning, educating yourself. How, what are you willing to sacrifice, man? How hard are you willing to work? How bad do you want it? Right. Some people say they want it. Right. But then you push comes to shove and they're like, uh, like, like how bad do you want it? Yeah. I mean, and, well, really how bad do you want down to how bad do you want that flexibility of passive? Cause like it just, it, again, I lead the attraction of that to not have the added pressure to have to go to work, but then doing what like having the focus of being able to work on something in your business whilst having the passive as well. It doesn't mean that you need to take the full switch like what you've done to that space. It just means that ultimately there's not as much pressure. And I think that you find that without that pressure, you know, you actually perform better in that maybe that nine to five sales perspective or that that real estate role. You can make calm and educated decisions. But let's say that somebody wants to do this. They don't have any infrastructure to it at the moment. Where do they start, Justin? What's the first investment that they need to look for from a property standpoint? Because let's face it, that's really the only pathway to, pro- to passive income. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, you need to decide. It's no different than I did. When we bought our first property, our $100,000 condo in Murrieta, California, in the midst of the financial mm-hmm. crisis where we started, we put $25,000 down, right? Yep. At that time, I was getting my ass kicked, right? I didn't have the ability. I didn't have the capital nor the ability to sign on the loans at that time. Right. Right. And I went to a Tom Ferry conference and that was in like two, 2008. And I'm sitting there in the audience with 5,000 realtors 
And Tom Ferry's out on stage, rah rah and everybody up, and it was great. And he comes out on stage, he's like, All right, all right, all right. Who here in this audience wants to own rental income property? Right? And everybody's hands, all the realtors, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next question was, Okay, everybody, who here in this audience can actually financially afford rental income property right now? And this is fine. This is 2008, mind you. Okay. Right, right, right. Everybody's losing their ass. And of course, 95% of the hands go down. It's like, wah, wah. And he, then he says, guys, you're missing the entire secret. And everybody's like, what? And he says, listen, you don't need to have a single dime to invest in real estate. You just need to have friends who have the money to invest in real estate. He says, you are the power. You have a real estate license, right? You can find the deals. You can underwrite the deals. You can manage the deals. You can run the company. You can bring enormous sweat equity to that partnership. I said, if you can't, if you don't have the down payment and you can't sign on the loan, you need to go find somebody who can, who's not in real estate, meaning they can't do what you can do. It doesn't do anybody, two realtors do this. That doesn't work. It needs to be in my position, like I had my buddy, Christopher Poli, who was not in real estate. He wanted to be. We had lots of conversations about owning apartments. But he needed someone like me that had the knowledge and the background to then bring it to the table. I'll be the bird dog hunting everything and the ground person doing all the work. He's going to provide the capital initially and he's going to sign on the loans initially so we can get going. Yeah. And you need to find somebody. If you can't do it yourself, that's where the partnership lies. You have to bring value. And once that so happens, how did that? Sorry, mate. Sorry. How does that partnership structure work? That first deal, mm -hmm. like again, let's say that you didn't put any money into that deal. How did that partnership work? He signs the loan. He puts all the money in, but what do you get? Like, is your name on title or do you have a partnership yeah, so we, agreement? We had our, uh, yeah, we, we had our LLC. Um, it was a 50-50 setup. All my stuff was sweat equity. So I keep in mind, so I rolled in my commissions to, from the deal into it. So that was essentially equity. I property managed it for free equity, right? I found the deals, found the tenants, ran this whole show, ran the company, did all the bullshit, yep, right? yep. which is enormous. And yes. for that, you get sweat equity. And yep. I got 50%. And Chris was totally satisfied with that because when he saw how much, I mean, keep in mind, his equity in the deal, his actual cash, that 25 grand gets a preferred return. So he's getting eight, he's getting 8% on that money before we're splitting 50 50. Does that make sense? Right. That right. does so make he gets sense. That 8%, uh, off the top. Correct. Yep. And then we split 50 50 profits, right? But he's getting a return for that actual equity in the deal. So it's not like he's not getting a return on it. And then we just split 50 50. It's the preferred yeah. return and then the 50 50 splits. And then now we're at a point where we're both putting in money pair pursue. We both can sign on the loans, right? We both have the ability to do this stuff. But he has enormous resources with capital connections, right? Yes. Being in the tech industry, right? Of course. In, the, in the government industry and a lot of very, you know, astute people uh, where it helps us tremendously. And then the other co-general partners and people we've connected with and so forth from the capital perspective. So then you start to realize, oh, shit. So it's actually easier to raise $10 million than it is to raise a million <laughs> like once I once I figured that out, I'm like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, yeah, wow. I mean, because what ends up happening when you get into the bigger deals, the economy is a scale change, and then you realize, oh God, the the real money out there is chasing the bigger deals because right. the pie is bigger and there's more ways to split up the pie. Right? When you get into smaller deals, it's not that it's hard to raise the money; it's harder because there's not as many sources there. You're dealing with mom and pop. Versus some large kind of check writers up here, it's more mom and pop here. So you got to source it harder to get that same million bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, and they're and they're a little they're probably more sensitive to like you and I have seen this countless times with people with their biggest asset where that's all their money and it might be six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. They they they're uncomfortable parting way with fifty thousand dollars because it's such a large chunk of what they have. Yeah. So yeah, that makes yeah. And so sense. we we make sure you know depending on the type of syndication we do, you know, you have to follow SEC guidelines. Um, and you know that's a whole other discussion. But there's different types of ways to do that where you're basically getting an exemption from the SEC to do a private offering 
versus a public stock offering. You're doing a right. private stock offering. And with that, you know, there's shares of the asset that are sold and people buy shares of that asset at say 50,000 or a hundred thousand a pop. Okay. And you typically have to be what's called an accredited investor to invest so have in a net deals. worth over a million, have a net worth over a million dollars. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, and I get it why they're doing that. They're making sure that you're not taking grandma's last 50 grand. And then you sure you show up on an American Greece show three years from now. I mean, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's the whole point. You know, I get it. So, but there's two, you can also do deals with non-accredited investors too. And so we've done a few of those on our first smaller ones where someone yep. can come into the deal for 25 grand or 50 grand or 10 grand and they don't have to be accredited. They can just be an investor who understands and they are risking. Uh, we typically will make sure that like we're not taking your last 10 grand, right? Like you yeah, can, yeah, of course. You, you could risk losing this, heaven forbid it gets lost. And so, right. I mean, we're not planning that obviously, but we don't want, you know, that because that's horrible. Yeah, of course. Well, I guess that made the, the, as we round out the podcast and, uh, and sort of, uh, reflect on what we've gone through, I think that the story and the journey of that passive income and uh, the commitment that you gave to yourself to get off the real estate, re the residential real estate sector, you know, again, I think that there is a proof that it can be done. One, I think that's important for the validation of what you've done for people out there to know that there possibly is an end game. Two is that I think that you, if, even if people got 50% of what they needed to make out of you know some passive income, I, it would make them infinitely better realtors. It would make them infinitely better decision makers for the people that they're representing in their biggest assets. You know, all of those different things. I think that this is a pathway that you've shed a light to people that it is possible by going down the residential path to actually get out of it to some extent, because I'm sure that people have created habits and lifestyles where they're obligated to do it versus being mm -hmm. passionate about it. And I think that, yeah. that whilst people may not see it, see it going to the extreme that you've done it, but ultimately doing it in a, in a smaller fashion can give them some sense of freedom indeed. Yeah, because you don't like, you hit the nail on the head. You don't have to do the full blow, right? I mean, there's a hybrid model where you could just, you know, with your own money that you make from residential sales, put it in and actually own a hundred percent of a few properties. And maybe there's yeah. some Airbnbs in there, right? So there's different ways yeah. to do this to generate a side hustle um, that provides an income. You know, there's different ways to do it. So yeah, you don't have to do this full blow. I'm trying to get to 10,000 units, right? I mean, that, I'm, I'm nuts, <laughs> but you know, I, cool. I know that we, I know that we can do it. You know, yeah. I know that we can do it. It's just a matter of right now, there's some shellacking that's going on in the industry, just given the capital <laughs> market environment, but there's also opportunity too. So you know, once we get some of the stuff here stabilized, you know, we're already on the lookout because I know stuff's coming. Um, and I think things are going to get worse in the short term uh, yep. before they get so, so if someone needs to get in touch with you, Justin, I'm going to put your, you've got a podcast that you guys uh, do. So um, what's the name of the podcast? And I'll link it in the, in the bio below. Yeah. So it's abundance to give. Uh, and then they can just go, listen, go to my website, justincbrennan.com. Uh, listen, we have so much free information on that site. If you want to learn multifamily, there's free downloads, there's eBooks, there's, you want to pro forma download template, there's free on there. We have free training classes, all kinds of free stuff for you to learn multifamily. And then, sure, if you want to jump in and kind of do more intensive type learning, we have courses and stuff that I had people put together that uh, in a mentorship program that finally somebody came to me and they said, Justin, you need to start teaching this stuff and put it all and package it all. And I said, yeah, but I said, I want to do a lot of free stuff too, because there's a lot of free info that you can give to people. And then, sure, if they want to take the next leap, they yeah. can dive into some kind of paid type stuff, right? So. Wonderful, mate. Well, again, we appreciate you giving the insights because at the end of the day, I think that, you know, you're the one that sort of scratched it all together and learned it all and actually gone through and obviously it pulled together a great deal of resource in your own right to then learn. And now you're out doing it. I think that it speaks volumes for the success that you've had, but also mate, it's been great to be part of that residential journey, the auction journey as well. It's been, that was a, uh, that was a hell of a I lot mean, of fun dude, while we so were doing I, it. Listen, I still have my broker's license. I still do a little bit of deals. Um, I'm not prospecting every day for it, obviously, but people are like, so are you fully out of it? I said, well, no, not entirely. But I said, who? I said, I'm never getting rid of it because I'm like, who yeah. knows? the world can come to an end and I have to go sell real estate again. I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I sure exactly. Hope, it, 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 I hope not. It gives you some. It gives you some confidence, doesn't it? Knowing that if if everything go if the if the world of multifamily comes to an end, you could legitimately go and within three months have a pretty decent income being that realtor by leveraging what you know and what you understand and how you operate. Yeah, you can go hustle again, right? And put deals together and get on the transactional again. And listen, I've I've never closed that door because you just never know what's going to happen. So. Indeed, mate. Well, again, we appreciate all the time that you've given us today. And I think that this is going to be a very view, valuable episode for those that are listening. So thanks again. The real question is, Ben, when are we going golfing with the Aussies? Uh-huh. It's a public call out. It's a public call out. Uh, Justin's tried to set this up a couple of times now. Mate, you just need to give me give me a no, couple no, of weeks we notice and we're uh, in. Jason, Jason has set a date. I think it's in February, if I'm not mistaken. Double check. Oh, it is. It is. It is. It is. It's just before our conference. So yes. See? There we go. Good deal, mate. No, no, well, we're no in. backing out. No, ba- it's going to be Aussies against Americans. It's like an international <laughs> conference between. Oh well, we being... already we already know who wins that. Well, we already you know, knows who wins that. See, but it changes when alcohol gets involved. Then. <laughs> oh, hey, mate. Last time I played golf with you, I'm pretty confident that I'm. See, beat because you, you, like you and Jason are kind of lightweights. I know. I get it. <laughs> you, know, you, you have a couple shots, and it all goes downhill. I understand. Oh, because they associate Australians with alcohol and lightweight. I'm sure that happens. No, no, no. (laughs) Well, mate, thank you again. Looking forward to whooping you on the golf course, but I'll see you soon. (laughs) So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us, and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.